Hello, students, and welcome to uh, Chapter 1 of Marketing 3336. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, Chapter 1 specifically titled Marketing, Creating Customer Value and Engagement. And uh, this is reflecting on uh, the principles of marketing, uh, Kotler and Armstrong, 18th edition. So uh, many of you has af have asked the question, is it okay that we have the 17th or 16th edition? I'm a little concerned about if you are studying directly from the 17th or 16th that you may actually miss some content. There has been some uh, significant updates between those last editions and the 18th edition, uh, and you may miss a little bit of content from that. So that's why I specifically uh, shared uh, the links to the 18th edition content uh, in my syllabus as well as, as on our Blackboard site for you to be able to make sure you get the right edition. We've done everything possible to be able to reduce costs for this class by only requiring the book in the digital version that should keep the cost down to around $50. Uh, in the class, $60 maximum, depending on if you buy from the bookstore or buy directly from Pearson. So I'd encourage you all to get the uh, 18th edition. It's going to be helpful for you both on the quizzes as well as the uh, final examination. I just don't want you to miss any content. Okay, with that said, uh, this will be the first chapter, chapter one that we're talking about. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you today about uh, marketing, creating customer value and engagement. This is a really important topic because it sets the foundation for everything this semester. In fact, what we're really talking about here is defining marketing overall and the evolution of what is thought as marketing. If you went back historically, many people thought of marketing as simply just getting a communication tool of getting the message out, a lot around the idea of advertising. However, marketing is a much greater concept than that. In fact, the, just demonstrated by the title, Creating Customer Value. The idea of creating value is, is that marketing is just not about communication. It's actually about adding value to the way the customer experiences the entire situation. So uh, we're going to talk about that today and think about this evolution of marketing and this concept of creating customer value and engagement. So, so to get started on this, I'd like to first start off by providing an example that was actually given in your book as well, but I'd like to highlight on this uh, and get into it in much more detail as well. So I think that the Jeff Bezos example of Amazon is an absolutely great example for the evolution of an organization and the idea that the organization has been focused on creating genuine value for customers. So if you think about the original organization in 1985 that Jeff Bezos started, many people thought of that company as simply an internet company that sells books. And they were competing against physical bookstores. Uh, that were out there. Many of you may have uh, remember Barnes and Noble bookstores were present everywhere. Uh, there were a number of mom and pop bookstores everywhere, but Bezos had an idea that he was going to be able to make available every single possible book online. And his vision for Amazon was much greater than books. He thought of it as expanding into all kinds of other areas where he could create genuine customer value. So one of his quotes was, the thing that drives everything is creating genuine value for customers. That's one of the quotes by Bezos. Now, I want to share with you uh, a little clip from uh, the movie Amazon Empire. So for those of you who have never watched this before, it's actually a great movie. It's available for free on YouTube if you want to go check it out. Uh, but it's actually a PBS special about uh, Jeff Bezos. And what it does is it actually – it goes through the evolution of Amazon from all the way in its beginnings to now, even talking about it when Bezos first started out the organization, his thought process about it and where it evolved to. And, and you can see some of his original thinking around the organization. In fact, I'd like to share with you just a brief clip uh, from the movie that gets uh, you some thought process about what was going on in his head and how he was thinking of uh, of this idea of creating genuine value for customers. So let me show you this short clip and uh, hopefully this gets you some insights into his thought process around that. I really enjoyed this. This is the original sign that I made for Amazon.com, blue spray paint on white poster board. 
Jeff wasn't a figure out of folklore at that point. He was not the, the wealthiest man in the world. Here's my computer, Amazon.com, up on the screen. Hello, Jeff Bezos. My he was a small, nondescript, sandy-haired man sitting at a desk with quite a large and eruptive laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't threatening. He was a normal guy to a sort of amazing extent. Hal 9000 hat, it's very important. Hal and I share a birthday. We're both born on January 12th. It belied a, you know, an enormous Napoleonic ambition. One of the people I really like, Thomas Edison, here's a model of his original light bulb. He is famous for saying 1% one, one inspiration, 99% perspiration. <laughs> it turns out ideas are the easy part. Execution is everything. Domination was on Jeff's mind from the beginning. One of his sort of second in command people said to me, you have to understand that Jeff wants to sell many more things than books. And Jeff's idea is that uh, in the near distant future, you could buy a kayak from Amazon. And, if, and after you bought the kayak, you could figure out good places to kayak and buy travel services from Amazon. That's not the first so those ambitions were very clear, and this was very early on. But he was clearly thinking in those terms from the get-go. How did that ring to you at the time? A little bit exciting and a little bit nutty. Amazon.com, very good website. You should really try it. <laughs> if you signed on to work at a, a kind of futuristic bookstore, and the guy who owned it was suddenly talking about selling, you know, every object in the universe. You just weren't sure how seriously to take it. <laughs> Though his public image was often unserious. That was awesome! Inside the company, Bezos was a hard-charging manager relentlessly focused on the principle that would make Amazon one of the most trusted brands in the world. The customer always comes first. This culture of customer obsession. Obsessive focus on customer. Obsesses over our customers. Totally obsessing over the customer experience. We used to call it customer ecstasy. It means building, delivering, focusing on your customer. And we did it you know, in the very, very early days at every stage. Jennifer Cast was there in the early days and is one of six top Amazon executives the company put forward to speak to us. Customer obsession was our North Star. Um, and so, you know, it was a place where we knew we were a part of something that was new, the internet. Um, there was an excitement that we were doing something that hadn't been done before. It was exhilarating. Um, we were all aligned around building for customers. Hey, you guys. Hey. <laughs> I've heard there was an empty chair that would often be put at what meetings. Yeah. Who was in the empty chair? Yeah, so that empty chair was there to remind us all to understand the customer, have empathy for the customer, understand the details of the customer experience. The customer isn't there. We have to bring forward the voice of the customer. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an understanding of where Bezos was coming from when he actually started Amazon and the idea about being so customer centric. We're going to talk about that when we define uh, marketing today and, and talk a little bit about the, the, the foundations of marketing and what makes for effective marketing. So if we, uh, we go to the definition of marketing that our book provides, it's marketing is a process by which companies create value for customers and build strong customer relationships in order to capture value from customers in return. So the idea is, is that the organization will do things or make an effort to create as much value as possible for that customer that will be working with them. And, and with the idea that the customer feels the amount of value, they, they feel, and we're going to talk about what value is in a minute in, 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 with respect to a consumer. But we want to be able to build that value, that feeling of value of a strong relationship with that, with that company. And as a result, we reciprocate by our return of that value. What, what do we mean by return of value? So think about some of those companies that you feel best about. 
for, for whatever reason, you're very loyal to them, you've worked with them, uh, you work with them regularly, you, you like everybody there, everything about the, the organization. So, so that company typically has created some valuable experience for you or there's something about it that makes you feel passionate. As a result of that, you are loyal. Not only are you loyal, you refer other people maybe to that organization or that company. You may spend more money than the average person does to be able to actually support that organization. I mean, I can think of some examples during uh, the COVID crisis where organizations that had such loyal customers were coming in and giving huge tips to the waiting, the wait staff, uh, really trying to help sustain the organization, for example, at restaurants because they felt so passionate about the organization as a whole. So marketing is just part of this entire process by which we create value for the customer. We're gonna talk about how this value creation actually occurs uh, in, in an organization. So let's talk about the marketing process. This is pretty basic, but it actually gives you the strategy, the steps by which an organization works to be able to try to capture value for customers in terms of profits, and, uh, and customer equity. So I'm gonna actually go over here and I'm gonna start off with, uh, with this concept of understanding the marketplace. So if we go to understand the marketplace, customer needs and wants, the first thing that we're gonna be doing, and we'll be talking about this quite a bit this semester, is actually scanning the marketplace, doing research in the marketplace, studying our customers, so constantly tapping into data and information about the markets, to be able to adapt and be able to create uh, unique opportunities to be able to make sure that we're up to date and offering the things that our customer base really wants. So next, so we understand that marketplace and our customer needs and wants. The next thing we do is we design a customer value driven marketing strategy. So based on all that information we've captured, we come up with a marketing strategy that specifically adapts to those customers that we are really interested in tapping into. So we define who our customer base is that we're going after. And not only do we, uh, do we bring a communication campaign, but we think about all the ways in which we as an organization can drive value for that customer base and be able to capture that value in return from them. The next thing that we do is we construct an integrated marketing program that delivers superior value. We're gonna actually go into an entire chapter on integrated marketing. And what we mean by integrated marketing is that all of our marketing touch points, that could be sales, uh, that, that could be advertising, uh, that could be dis, uh, display advertising in stores, or billboards, every piece of communication, every piece of touch point to the customer is all coordinated such that we optimize that and we bring it to the marketplace in a way that maximizes value for that customer. And that's what we call an integrated marketing program. From that, we engage our customers building profitable relationships and creating customer delight. So uh, one of the first things that we want to be able to make sure of is the customers that we serve, uh, we want to be able to build profitable relationships. So what we mean by that is that although we give services and we provide products, uh, to be able to bring value to them. In return, we want to get value back. And in that, in that terms, one of the ways we get value back is in terms of profits. And that is the money that we make or the revenue that we make and the profits we make as an organization. And from that experience that we have on both sides, our goal is to actually create what we call customer delight. We're gonna talk about this. This is beyond being satisfied. This is actually being delighted as a customer. So this is, this is, these are the individuals who come back and, and are passionate about our organization. And like I talked about, recommend it to others, make, uh, hold that organization in very high regard. And as a result of that, we capture value from our customers in return. We create our profits and uh, we create customer equity. And we'll talk about this concept of customer equity, which is a long-term value from that customer. Okay. So, uh, so thinking about that, we want to move forward to be able to understand when we talk about this understanding the marketplace and customer needs, we, I, one of the things in marketing that's fundamental about everything is we want to be able to understand this concept of needs, wants, and demands. 
So let's, let's think about each of these needs, wants, and demands. So when we think about needs, this is the highest order element that, that a, a consumer or customer comes through is the idea of needs. So the idea of needs is, is that I need something. So there's a lot of things that I might need. I might, I might have base or foundational needs, like I might need food or safety or things of this nature, but I also might have other needs that, that, that go beyond that. Depending on where I am in society or what uh, my situation is, could be social elements, uh, it could be personal elements of, of, of how, I'm, uh, how I'm living, things like this drive what we call of our needs. Those needs push us into what we call wants. They, they, wants take the form, uh, form from those needs that we have. So we have needs, and then from that, we start to want things to be able to fulfill our needs. So the wants are those things that, that we actually pursue to fulfill our needs. So we say to ourselves, wow, I really want that, uh, that, that new uh, car. Uh, that car is, uh, I really, uh, I, so I might need a car for transportation, but then I, it forms into a want. I want to be able to acquire a car. And then the question, the next statement is what we call demands, is I might want a car, but I might not be able to afford a car. So the difference between a want and a demand is a demand is actually backed by buying power. So a person may want something, but they, the, they, they don't, it doesn't translate into a demand because they can't actually afford it. So what we want to understand from our customers when we're analyzing a marketplace is we want to understand what needs are we tapping into with our product? How does that turn into a want? And then when does that translate into a demand? So there are certain products that are out there, for example, uh, luxury products, where the wants never translate into demands, where a person actually doesn't actually have the buying power to be able to obtain it. So we want to be able to think about these things in all three elements, needs, wants, and demands. So let's talk about this concept of what we mean by customer value. So value is actually a balance on two ends of things. And so, uh, on one side, we have the marketers that are out there doing our marketing, do our, our advertising, putting all this information out there about what to expect from our products and our services. So let's go back to that restaurant example. If we talk about having the very best hamburger that's, uh, that's, that, that can be created, and, you know, let's just, let's just say that we are a McDonald's and we start advertising, say that we have actually the highest quality, the very best hamburger that you can get out there in the marketplace. This is what we're doing is we're actually advertising, but we're, we, we could be setting the, uh, an expectation for a consumer. Then the consumer goes in to be able to get that hamburger. And the question is, did they get the very best hamburger that they expected, so or did they get what they expected that they would get from McDonald's? So, there are, there are things that set the expectation. The marketers help to set expectations, and then there's value delivery. We want to base balance out our expectations and our customers' value delivery. So, one of the things that that delight comes from is be, and we talked about this customer delight earlier, is when you set an expectation level, but you are able to exceed that expectation level as an organization. So I'll give you some examples of this. There's all these really great books out there uh, talking about delight. Uh, one of the books that came out recently by the customer executive board that talked about delight gave all kinds of really excellent examples. I'll, I'll just give you an example of this. A family goes to Disney World, uh, while they're at Disney, they're, uh, they're uh, staying in a hotel room. They really enjoyed their stay in that hotel room. In fact, they stayed at one of the top hotels at Disney called the Grand Floridian. If any of you have ever been to Disney, it's one of the top resorts at Disney. So they stayed at the Grand Floridian. They experienced this. They'd saved up a lot of money for this experience of staying at Disney World at the uh, Grand Floridian. And, uh, and while they were there, uh, they had really nice experiences, and they, they really went away thinking, wow, this is a, this is a very uh, excellent hotel. But as they left, one of the things they realized is, is their daughter had lost uh, her lovey, so her stuffed animal. And, uh, and they came back, and they looked, and they couldn't find it anywhere, and they had already traveled back to Iowa. 
And, uh, and one of the things that the Disney staff did was one of the uh, housekeeping people actually found that little lovey. It was a bunny, actually. And, uh, and they, they took that bunny. And what they did was they, 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 they got the contact and they, because it's not unusual for a child to lose one of these toys in the room. And the family said, oh, you've got the bunny. That's great. So not, they didn't just pack up the bunny and ship it back to the family and the girl. What they did was they actually took that bunny, they brought it around, and they had the, the, the very favored princess of that child, the, the favorite character of that child, uh, actually Cinderella, hold that bunny and, and make a little saying and, and take some photos with the bunny. Uh, they took photos with uh, some other uh, characters and then they shipped it back with those clips and everything back to the family. Uh, and the family was actually able to see the experience that Bunny had while Bunny was at Disney World and sent it back to the family. You, as you can imagine from this, this exceeds any expectation that that family had. And it drove it to what we'd call the delight level. So they exceeded what we would call traditional expectations. They went to delight. What do you think? Is that family going to go back to Disney? Or are they going to be passionate about Disney? Yes. So this is an example of exceeding expectations uh, from the, the, the side of, uh, of service to the market. I want to talk about the evolution, and this won't be from our book, this is my own thought process, about the evolution of business models that are out there in the marketplace. So uh, this, is, this is the traditional model of marketing. If we went back 15, 20 years ago and we thought about marketing, we thought about selling, this would be what the, the traditional mindset of the way marketing took place. And I like to call this the better mousetrap model. So the idea was, is, is that, uh, is that we create a mousetrap. So our company creates a mousetrap that's unique and highly differentiated. What do we mean by that? We have created a product that is unique from everybody else's product in the marketplace, and it's very different than everybody else's product. Uh, so our mousetrap is, is, uh, is a really great mousetrap, and it catches mice in a different way than everybody else's does, and it ends up being an even better mousetrap than anybody else has. That's what means differentiated means highly different than everybody else's. So then, then what happens from that is, is that the value itself lies in the mousetrap. So the organization has created this great mousetrap, and nobody else has a mousetrap like it. So really what happens is you just need to be able to tell everybody about this amazing mousetrap that you've created into, uh, the, the, and be able to sell and market that mousetrap. So the role of marketing is to communicate value about our mousetrap. So if we wanted to be a great marketing organization in this situation, what we would do is go out there and talk to everybody about what a wonderful mousetrap we have. And, and as a result of that, then we find that, uh, so marketing is what we call value communication. So this is the old school thought about the way marketing is. And this is not creating value through marketing. This is simply using communication to create the value of the product that already exists in the marketplace. But let's think about what's happened today. As I talked about last week, markets are becoming more and more competitive. So what happens out there if we develop a mousetrap, somebody else develops a mousetrap right away that's just as good as our mousetrap. Maybe it's even better than our mousetrap. Think about the innovations around iPhone or think about all the technology innovations. All of these other organizations quickly follow with their innovation or their products. So this is what we call the alternative business model. So this, this gap of difference between our product and everybody else isn't out there as much. So we have to figure out ways to differentiate ourselves that are beyond the product itself. And that's what marketing does. So our, the first realization is our mousetrap is just one of many ways to kill mice. So we might have a mousetrap, but other people also sell mousetraps. So there are other ways to catch mice. That's the first realization. So the second realization is that there's not enough value in our mousetrap by itself to make us that much better than everybody else. So our, my, our mousetrap might be incrementally better than everybody else's, but we have to do something to be able to make ourselves special. So if we think about that, and we think about what we would do next, 
So the role of marketing is to add value to the mousetrap. What can we do as marketers to make our mousetrap or, or sales, our mousetrap better than everybody else's mousetrap? So, so that gets to the last step. So marketing becomes what we call value creation instead of value communication. So our job in marketing is to help build an experience that that customer has, to build that total experience to make them passionate about our product, about our services, so that their experience is excellent and they'll go out there, they'll buy from us again, they'll, they'll, they'll recommend our products to others. So, so it really is a total experience difference. And this is what we call the alternative business model now. And that's really what marketing is about now. It's creating this value. So when we think about understanding our marketplace, this is a very important uh, thing for us to start understanding here. So this is a figure from the book. And, uh, and I want to talk about this a second because many of you probably haven't been exposed to all of these elements of the way people buy. So if we think about this, and I want to give you an example uh, of a situation this, uh, in this of, uh, of let's just do an, uh, an automotive manufacturer. So let's take in, in this example, uh, let's take BMW. So uh, many of you know BMW, uh, oftentimes uh, BMW is thought of as a premium auto manufacturer or luxury auto manufacturer. So if we think about the company itself that's here, let's think about the company as BMW. So let's think about what are some of the competitors to BMW. If we were to list out competitors in our mind, we might think of our, those competitors as like uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, Audi. Um, we, might think, uh, we might think of some of the other major brands that are out there, even some of the U.S. Uh, um, brands now like Cadillac could potentially be a competitor. But, but let's think of luxury vehicles. Okay, so our company's here. We have our competitors that are here, and uh, and what we have is we have suppliers actually that are out there that supply products and services to these companies that are used in the production of those products. So, for example, if we have BMW here, uh, um, and th this is BMW, uh, and is our company, and see, uh, we we have our BMW, and down here we have all the competitors. Uh, we think about our suppliers themselves. We might have companies uh, that supply on this side tires, for example, we, uh, to our manufacturers. We might have companies that, that supply all types of elements of differentiated auto parts. So, so some of these tires, uh, some of these, uh, the metal that goes into our, our cars, some engine parts, uh, even some of the navigation systems, all kinds of things that go into it. Uh, can be supplied by suppliers downstream that go into our products. In fact, many companies boast the value of elements that they get downstream in their products. Oftentimes, when you go to buy a luxury vehicle, you might see the stereo or sound system in that, uh, in, in that, in that vehicle. So, for example, I was recently at an Audi dealership, and one of the options was to get a uh, – um, a uh, Bose sound system in the vehicle, uh, or, or you could get even higher level premium sound systems in the vehicle beyond Bose sound systems. So there were all kinds of differentiated uh, branded things that would go into that BMW. So these are the suppliers that supply downstream to the companies that manufacture and also sell. And then we might have what we call marketing intermediaries that help sell or, or, or sell or distribute our products. So for example, BMW makes uh, um, automobiles, but in the United States, we have BMW dealerships that are independent of BMW and independently owned that market and sell those BMWs. So those BMWs are distributed to the marketing to those dealerships, and those dealerships will sell it to you, the final consumer downstream. Now, marketing and mark and forces all happen throughout this entire what we call supply chain. So the suppliers are constantly marketing downstream to the uh, to to BMW. BMW is competing with those competitors. The suppliers are selling to them as well as the competitors. They are selling downstream to the marketing intermediaries and being able to make sure they distribute those products. And those products are then distributed downstream to the final consumer. So this, this entire chain or understanding this marketplace 
drives customer needs all the way downstream. So these suppliers, let's say these audio suppliers that supply audio for the final users, they not have to they not only have to be able to market specifically to BMW, but they have to market downstream to final customers. So if you wanted to get a Bose uh, um, sound system in your vehicle or an Alpine sound system in your vehicle, you might actually look upstream and you might then uh, be able to look for it when these market intermediaries like dealerships sell the BMWs. So all of these forces affect across the board and customers are buying all the way downstream to what we call the consumer. So I want to talk about the difference between a customer and a consumer. So a customer is, is, is an individual that buys from somebody upstream. So a customer buys upstream, but the ultimate person that actually uses that product or service is what we call the consumer. So the consumer is the ultimate user of that product or service. The consumer is also a customer because they purchased uh, upstream, they, they, they are customer. But a, a customer is all of these, BMW, the competitor, the intermediary, all the way, anyone that participates in a transaction that gains value is a customer. And then we have our ultimate end consumer, the one who consumes that product or service. Okay. So next, let's talk about a few concepts that are very important to us in marketing that we're going to get to, but there's some terminology that we really have to be familiar with uh, throughout the semester. Uh, the first is what we call market segmentation. So market segmentation is the idea that we have all these customers that are out there in the marketplace, and we're trying to divide these customers into subsets or subgroups into the marketplace. And that, that's what we call market segmentation. So dividing customers into smaller subsets or smaller subgroups. There are a number of ways in which we can divide customers or segment them in the marketplace. I'll give you an example. Uh, we could uh, segment customers based on generational data. Uh, for example, we could be able to look at the uh, boomers, the Gen X, uh, uh, the millennials. Uh, so we could look across generational differences in the way consumers buy and we might market to different consumers or sell to different, uh, uh, di different generations. We're going to talk about that a little later in the semester, this generational marketing concept. We may actually find out that market segments could, could also be different areas of the country, geographies. So, for example, the northeast of the country versus the south versus the west of the country may actually have different needs or demands in the marketplace. Could be based on the environment. Uh, and what I mean by that is like weather, for example, the north uh, east becomes colder faster. So uh, the products are, that we sell to that marketplace could be different than the south of the United States. Um, could be cultural issues that uh, drive market segmentation. But anytime we divide our market into subsets, that drives what we call a market segmentation. The next is the target marketing, and that is where we choose the market segments that we're trying to uniquely go after uh, to be able to market our products. So if we, if uh, let's say that we have divided it up into the generations and, uh, and we profile the generational need for automobiles and we're particularly interested in uh, attracting boomers uh, to the marketplace, we would want to be able to come up with a marketing and advertising campaign and products that are attractive to boomers in the marketplace. And we would profile those products and services in a way that uh, boomers would find those uh, products very valuable. So uh, when we oftentimes when we think about this concept of uh, designing or choosing what we call uh, a value proposition, so what we would do is once we uh, first segmented our market and then chose the segment that we're going after, the next thing that we would do is what we call uh, develop what we call a brand's value proposition. So a value proposition is the set of benefits that a brand promises or a product promises to deliver to customers to satisfy their needs. That's what we call a value proposition. So, uh, so Sonos uh, 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 positions its Sonos One with Amazon Alexa as a smart speaker for music lovers. It gives you all the advantages of Alexa, but with high quality Sonos sound. Um, I know that I own a Sonos. Many of you might uh, might own one, but essentially, what that is 
is it pairs up with the Alexa and it allows you to be able to optimize the sound with the Alexa. So that's actually what they're, what we call their value proposition. They're trying to bring value to you in the marketplace by, uh, through this offering. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a, qu a quick clip that talks about value propositions. This is a nice one. It's actually from the board, value board, uh, that talks about this concept of value proposition. I'd like to show you a short video, and we're going to talk about a couple of value propositions briefly. What is a value proposition? It is the essential articulation of the value that any organization, whether business or nonprofit, provides to its customers. Lots of people talk about value propositions. There are many differing descriptions of what constitutes a value proposition. Commonly, it describes the collection of products and services a business offers to meet the needs of its customers. It also includes the ways in which those products and services are different from competing offers. However, a value proposition is much more than just a simple articulation of the value an organization provides. It is the key foundation that underpins a business model and an essential tool for testing your business hypothesis in the world. There are four key elements of a good value proposition. One, who is the customer? Who is the value for? Two, what problem are you solving for this customer? Three, what is your solution? And how is it solving the problem? And four, what are your differentiators? How is your solution better than what's already out there? Differentiators must be quantifiable so that they can be tested and measured with your customers. Why is this important? You need to be able to test whether the solution you're providing actually fits a need. If you can't quantify the solution to customers, you won't know whether your solution is sufficient. If it's not quite a fit, you'll want to make changes to your product early to better align it with the needs of the customer. Let's look at an example. Spring Health is a company founded by well-known social entrepreneur and thought leader Paul Pollock. He saw an opportunity to improve the health of families while significantly lowering the cost of drinking water in smaller villages in India. Let's look at the four elements of Spring Health's value proposition. First, the customers are rural villagers who have no reliable access to clean water. Second, the problem is that available solutions are too big and expensive relative to the demand of a smaller village. Because of this, 90% of families are drinking bad water, which makes them sick and requires costly doctor visits. Third, the solution developed was an inexpensive electrochlorinator that produces a chlorine solution which is distributed by a motorcycle rider to each village where the water in the village tank is treated. Sales are through a partner village shopkeeper on commission. Customers can easily get to the shop and buy water. Fourth, relative to competition, customers get water at a reasonable price, at a location convenient to their home, and with water quality assured by the company. As described in Paul's recent book, The Business Solution to Poverty, Paul and his team used their well-defined but still hypothetical value proposition to test their assumptions with customers. In that test, they found that a few of their differentiators needed modification. For example, they found that customers would pay more to have the water delivered to their homes. This became part of their differentiators. They were able to solve the last mile problem of water delivery at a price their customers can afford. A well-crafted value proposition is the first step to making sure you are solving the right problem for your customers. It allows you to test whether your customers care about the value you think you're providing. Testing your value proposition can save time and money and help you get your product to market faster. Okay. All right, so I want to give you a couple examples, and I want you to think about some of these value propositions. Uh, I was able to pull up uh, uh, five different value propositions that are shared from different companies. And thinking about, I'd like you to think about how well these value propositions are actually delivered through those organizations. 
So um, let's go through each of them. BMW. So BMW's promise is that what they call themselves the ultimate driving machine. So think about the expectation that that sets for you when you read that promise, the ultimate driving machine, uh, ultimate luxury, ultimate satisfaction. So that, that, that's their expectation they're setting through their value proposition. The Nissan Leaf electric car, 100% electric, zero gas, zero tailpipe. So the idea that, uh, that you're not actually going to be using any emission from that or carbon emission from that, uh, and you will be uh, conscious of the environment, 100% electric, zero gas. So that's one of the, one of the examples. Another is New Balance uh, Minimus shoes, like barefoot, only better. Uh, and, and anybody uh, ever used a Minimus shoe, it's the idea is, is that they're actually thinking about um, how to minimize the actual element of the shoe to be able to give you the, your experience of walking. So um, the next is the Vibram Five Finger Shoe. Uh, if anyone's ever used that before, their slogan is, we are the technology. That's their value proposition. So the idea that they are leveraging your own body um, for this five finger uh, shoe, what you see here is actually it goes around the toes for those of you who are into climbing and things. So you are the technology. Facebook, connect and share with people in your life. So the idea of connecting up and actually socializing and sharing with other people. And then YouTube provides a place for people to connect, inform, and inspire others across the globe. So I'd like you to just think about all these and, and think about the way these companies have set up what we call their value propositions. And I'd like you to think to yourself, well, which ones of these do I buy into? Um, uh, have I experienced any of these products? Do these appeal to me? Think about my own profile, my own background. And, uh, and, and realize whether they're targeting you from this type of an advertisement as well. So, um, so this is a very important way to think about things as far as their value proposition. What value will they bring to you? So one of the things that we're going to be talking about this semester quite a bit is, uh, is designing a customer value marketing strategy. So how do we design a strategy that actually focuses on the customer as a whole? So um, uh, we're going to be talking about several concepts that, w that uh, firms use to be able to bring strategy to the marketplace. The first is what we call production, the product concept, the selling concept, the marketing concept, and then what we call the societal marketing concept. I'm going to talk about each of these briefly. So the production concept, customers will favor products that are available and highly affordable. So the production concept is really the idea that, be, that to, to get our products out there is, uh, as cheaply and as widely available as possible to be able to maximize the availability of this product in the marketplace. So, so many, uh, many products actually try to do this. They try to make it as widely available as possible, as affordable as possible, so that anybody can use it. So this is actually just a, a general concept to produce and get this product out there to as many people as possible. That's one of what we call our marketing management orientations, the production concept. The product concept. Customers favor products that offer the most quality, performance, and features. So this focuses on product improvement. So the product concept, and this is what we were talking about before, is a focus on try to make the very best product that there is out there. And all the value is established from the product itself, how it differentiates itself from the other products in the marketplace. The selling concept. Customers will not buy enough of the firm's products unless the firm undertakes a large-scale selling and promotion effort. So this, oftentimes the selling concept are products that the product itself is not that different than the competitor's products. Uh, in fact, there's very little difference between your product and the competitors. We don't have a price advantage over anybody. Uh, we don't have this ubiquitous, this idea of, of, of huge availability throughout the marketplace. So what do we do? We have what we call the selling concept, and that is we have the most effective sales strategy out there. We push our product, we promote our product, we advertise our product into the marketplace. We're, we're everywhere out there. 
So uh, co companies that you'll say using the selling concept uh, are getting the information and advertising and promoting their product like crazy. And their product may not be different than the competitors, but they're getting that, that the concept and the, the knowledge of that product out there in the marketplace as available as possible. The next is what we call the marketing concept. We know the needs and wants of the target market. So if we think about our target market, who are those that we want to target? So remember, we talked about the segment, the market segments, and then the market, the target market is the, the segment that we're trying to go after. And we deliver our desired satisfactions better than any other company. So we focus on that market and we try to satisfy that group better than anybody else. And as a result, that's what we call our marketing concept. And then lastly, we have societal marketing. The company's marketing decisions consider the customer's wants, the company's requirements, and the customer's long-run interest and society's long-run interest. So in societal marketing, we're not only thinking about uh, the customer and satisfying that customer, but we're thinking about society as a whole. How can we be able to establish long-run viability, uh, um, be able to be able to sustainability, all of these other elements that get into what we call societal marketing, where not only are we marketing, but we're making things better for society as a whole. So that's, that's our last concept that we think about. I just like you to be familiar with these. We're going to reflect on all of these a little bit as we go throughout the semester, but these are just general definitions that you should be aware of. Now, our next steps for you all uh, to do, and, and I want you all to think about this uh, as we move forward. The first is make sure that you read chapter one in detail. Not only will you be responsible for uh, the content of my lecture, but you're going to be responsible for the reading and information in chapter one uh, in our lecture quizzes. And we're going to have a lecture quiz on chapters one and two. As far as the watch the application video, so we have another video that's associated with this chapter where we actually talk about applications. Every chapter we have a video application video that you watch. It's a short clip from managers that talk about the application of the concepts that are in this chapter, and we'll have a short quiz following those videos. So be able to prepare for it. Read the chapter. Uh, watch that application video. Answer those quiz questions. Be on top of things. See your syllabus for our Zoom office hours. We've been posting a lot of Zoom office hours for the class, so make sure you're attending and asking questions if you have any issues, and be able to reflect on your syllabus. Uh, we should get into a very established pattern as we move forward in the semester. Uh, have a good day, and uh, take care, everybody.